Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, thy sinful servant Afanasi, son of Nikita. The year is 1468. A little known merchant, Afanasi Nikitin, leaves his Russian homeland in search of better trade. His journey would take him 12,000 kilometers away to India. It would be a difficult and hazardous journey, traveling so far into the unknown. But Nikitin was a God-fearing traveler with an adventurous spirit. No Russian had ever ventured so far before, and in 1470, having traveled by horse, ship by foot, he became one of the first Europeans to reach the shores of India, even before Vasco da Gama. Five centuries go by. The year is 2006. An expedition sets off from Russia along the very route Nikitin once travelled and creates history as it does so. This is Nikitin's historic adventure retraced 540 years later. Except this time, the route will be covered by road in modern machines. It took Nikitin three years to reach India. Our 21st century travellers have set themselves the target of 46 days. Different times and different personalities have shaped India's relations with Russia. And the distance between these two countries has been crossed by sea, land and in imagination. There is some uh, strange attraction between Russians and Indians. And if there's one person who marks the starting point of the Indo-Russian friendship, it is Afanasi Nikitin. He wanted to come to India to see the fabulous, heroic country, the image of which was popular in Russia. Having to survive an arduous journey, Nikitin faced the daunting task of traveling across three seas, plunder, difficulties in food, accommodation and language. Nikitin left Tver and sailed down the Volga, crossed the Caspian Sea, Persia, and from the Strait of Hormuz, set sail for India. He lived there for three years before returning via the Arabian Sea, Africa, Persia, Turkey, sailing across the Black Sea to Kaffa. His travel journal was handed over to the court of Ivan III, and a copy was later discovered by the historian Nicholas Karamzin in a monastery near Moscow, some 300 years after Nikitin's death. Karamzin publicized Nikitin's notes, which were published later in the 19th century as voyage across the three seas. He was also a person, a good diarist, a good writer, a good philosopher. So the most important, the most precious things are his diaries. Nikitin was the first basis of medieval knowledge of Russia on India. To explore the nature of the Indo-Russian connections, past and present, and to pay tribute to the quintessential traveller. The modern-day expedition is organised by the Adventurers and Explorer Society. Sturdy vehicles manufactured by the Mahindra Group will be their mode of transport to undertake this extraordinary journey. The route that they will follow is a combination of Nikitin's journey to and from India. It will take them through five countries, giving them a taste of various cultures and people. From Russia onto Turkey, through the Caucasus onto Georgia, Azerbaijan, into Iran before reaching India at Chol and heading to Bidar in Karnataka. This expedition will serve the purpose of people to people contact, knowing Russia, Turkey, and other various areas where we are going, including Iran their culture, the, what they think of India, at the same time highlighting some of the unexplored areas to Indian audience so that they can also think about Russia beyond Moscow and St. Petersburg or Iran beyond Tehran. To trace this modern adventure in modern times is a mixed group of 10 people from different backgrounds, but with one common passion, for travel and exploring uncharted territory. The leader and organizer of the expedition, 
Falguni Matilal, a Russian historian who sees history come alive, Professor Hari Vasudevan, an energy expert and travel writer, Sudha Mahalinga, a Kathak dancer and observer of cultural profiles, Sharmishtha Mukherjee, a geopolitics expert, Ramakant Dvedi, a journalist, Sunrita Sen, a doctor and adventurer, Dr. Rajendra Jain, professional expedition driver and member of the special assignment team of Mahindra and Mahindra, Sudhir Kasha, rally drivers and technical crew, Abhinit Mehta and Sanjeev Thakur. St. Petersburg is the first city the expedition heads towards to collect the cars that have been shipped from India. One of Europe's renowned metropolises, it finds pride of place among Russia's most beautiful and modern cities. Once the capital of Tsarist Russia, it strongly evokes the country's past. Built in the 18th century by Peter the Great, the city didn't exist during Nikitin's time. It was from here that historian Karamzin proudly brought the Western world's attention to Nikitin and his travels. It was also here that Nikitin's account of his journey was first published. Preserving its past, St. Petersburg is rich in both art and culture. The team sees glimpses of Russian art at the Russian Museum. The enormous art and artifact collection at the Hermitage in the Winter Palace was once a part of Catherine the Great's private collection. It was in such a regal ambience that Russia's czars, her statesmen and scholars discussed the profound issues of the world, including the wonders of India's heritage. In his desire to promote relations with India, in his desire to, it's very committed and dedicated. And all these uh, friends of India, the Indologists, the experts on various fields, have nothing but uh, good words about India. I have set forth down the Volga from the Golden Dome Cathedral of Tver, from the Grand Duke Mikhail Borishevich, and from His Grace Bishop Gennady. The modern journey begins at Tver, a small provincial town in the upper Volga, where it all began with Nikitin 540 years ago. I'm certain that when Afanasi Nikitin set out, he must have felt a bit uncertain about what awaited him. Mr. Manchanda, the deputy chief of mission of the Indian Embassy, Moscow, symbolically flags off the expedition under the statue of Nikitin. Everyone feels a sense of excitement as the cars set off from the icy banks of the river Volga under a confetti of snowflakes. Little remains of the medieval Russia that Nikitin was familiar with. His home Tver is now a provincial capital surrounded by small towns. But in his time, it was a prosperous settlement centered in a Kremlin with lively trading taking place on the Volga and the adjoining river Tvertsa. A little away from the flowing Volga is the bustling city of Moscow. Here, the expedition members get a taste of contemporary Russia. Moscow, the town, was familiar to Nikitin and was then governed by Grand Prince Ivan III. Like all cities with a great past, old coexists with the new. Moscow is the political, economic and cultural capital that defines this massive nation. Today, consumerism has been unleashed and no longer is the Spartan lifestyle of the Soviet times visible. Fast-moving traffic, trendy stores, glitzy streets, neon hoardings have changed the face of Russia. This is a city that has old ties with India and continues to do so. Russia has uh, obvious strengths in certain areas, in uh, metallurgy, in uh, electrical power generation, in infrastructure area in general. We have strengths in information technology, in the pharmaceutical sector, in the automotive sector. But these are the areas in which we are not very present in Russia today. So we can explore this to have $10 billion worth of uh, trade between the two countries by 2010. Uh, this can't be achieved without making a strong effort on both sides. The old ties with India are quite evident in Moscow. There are Indo-Russian cultural exchanges taking place with Indian dance continuing to fascinate. Just how popular India is 
was obvious by the turnout at Sharmishta's Kathak workshop at the Jawaharlal Nehru Cultural Center. The students seem to enjoy every bit of it. There is a lot of interest in Indian classical dance, not only classical, in Indian culture, painting, architecture, everything uh, about India in Russia. It's not just dance, but also a study of India and Indian languages that fascinates many. India and Russia have always had strong academic and business ties. Today there are more than 15,000 Indians living in Russia most of them studying at various universities. The expedition team attended a conference at the Tver Medical Academy where they got the chance to meet some Indian students. India is better here. Education is cheap here. Yes, because India has a fee structure here. We have many seniors in India. We asked them and uh, two or three are uh, practicing doctors in India who have uh, completed their education from Russia. So it was a positive result. The team also interacted with the members of the Sun Group, a leading business house based in Moscow, with diverse interests in investment, gas, consumer goods and brewery sectors. Run by the Kemka family, the Sun Group has extensive business experience in Russia since the 50s. Having met the Indian diaspora at Moscow, the expedition now travels along the Volga or Mother Volga as the Russians call it. Not only is it the longest river in Europe, it's also the cultural and economic lifeline of the country. For centuries, she has served as the main thoroughfare and is of great importance to inland transport and shipping. The Volga has over 900 ports that line the river banks. An old port through which Nikitin passed and a major business hub today is Nizhny Novgorod. Situated on the confluence of the Oka and the Volga, in medieval times, Indian traders made their way here. Built by the Grand Prince Yuri in the year 1221, it has preserved its heritage. With the cathedral and Kremlin covered in white, Nizhny looks the perfect picture postcard. From 1932 to 1990, the city was called Gorky after the famous writer Maxim Gorky, who was born here. Today, Nizhny is the fourth largest city in Russia. The industrial period began in the 19th century and now it is one of the chief industrial cities. There is a popular saying that goes, Moscow is Russia's heart, St. Petersburg its head and Nizhny Novgorod is its pocket. 450 kilometers from Nizhny along the Ziguli Hills, driving through the snowy forest, the team reaches Kazan, the capital of the predominantly Muslim Republic of Tataristan. In Nikitin's time, this region was dominated by the heirs of Chengiz Khan, the Mongols or Tatars as the Russians called them. The territory was called the Golden Horde, which formed three separate khanates or kingdom ruled by khans. These were Kazan, Astrakhan and Crimea. The Muslim connection can be traced back to the 9th century when the original settlers of this region, the Volga Bulgars, converted. Though it is well known, the prevalence of Islam in the middle of European Russia is still striking. Kazan is one of the northernmost points in the world where Islam has spread. The newly built Kul Sharif Mosque is a tribute to a structure that once existed during Nikitin's time but was later destroyed. The Kazan Kremlin stands proud as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. 
This unique citadel has absorbed influences from two great world religions, Christianity and Islam, and represents an architectural synthesis of Tatar and Russian styles. The city of Kazan is as multicultural as India, with over a hundred different ethnic groups living together harmoniously. Its museum houses coins used for trade with India, which goes to show how old Indo-Russian ties are. There's even a travelogue by Bin Muhammad, who travelled to India in the 18th century. He wrote a, a travelogue, which is in the Tatar language, which even today has not been translated into any other major well-known language. So we do not know the account extremely well. Kazan, which has a number of universities, was where Lenin studied too. Close to Kazan is Ulyanovsk, once home to Lenin's family. The members visited the childhood home of Lenin, now a museum. It was here that Lenin's elder brother Alexander became a revolutionary, one of the many who inspired Indian revolutionaries in the early 1900s. After the October Revolution of 1917, the house became a respected spot for Indian socialists. For Lenin's help and respect for the Indian national movement, earned him the affection of the Indian freedom fighters. At the house of Euro-Asian friendship in Kazan, Kanjivaram silk saris and lehengas were the dress code for the day when a special show was put on for the expedition. It seems many Russians enjoy learning Bharat Natyam. But can Bollywood be far behind? The girls know all the steps to hit Hindi film songs and look quite attractive in lehenga cholis. Even Sharmishta gets into the mood and does an impromptu dance to the thal given by the audience. Raj Kapoor, we all know, was popular, but didn't know how much. At a way out place, the team bumps into an ardent fan, and they can't help but join in. <laughs> Samara, a night halt for the team, proves to be a bigger surprise than Kazan. Its members are invited to the House of Friendship where they can catch glimpses of India in a city that is hardly known back home. The House of Friendship is a dynamic educational experiment to provide children with a sense of beauty in a changing world. Indian exhibits play a prominent role and the team feels honoured to be guests here. Seeing all these things here, it looks like that they have a great respect for Indian culture over here. The centre has links with the Agni Publishing House, which has brought out prints of Rorik and an album of Babarnama miniatures and a translation of the Akbarnama. It's a rich slice of India in provincial Russia. As the expedition moves further south, surprises never end. With the special treatment that is being given by the local authorities, there is a warm reception that waits in the middle of nowhere, quite literally, to welcome the team as they enter the Saratov province. In traditional style, the guests are welcomed with bread and salt and a lot of dancing to folk tunes being played out on the accordion. The warmth of the local people is perhaps the key to braving the cold. The dance was very spontaneous, music was lovely, women are beautifully attired and I love their headgear. Heading to Volgograd, the expedition now reaches the point where the Volga River takes a sharp bend and heads to the Caspian Sea.
formerly known as Zara Sin in the 16th century, then Stalingrad during World War II. Today, it is known as Volgograd. There are virtually no remains of the past here, as this was the site of the decisive Battle of Stalingrad between Hitler's army and the Soviet troops from 1942 to 1943. Underestimating the Russian winter, the Germans lost the battle and the city of Volgograd was rebuilt from the rubble. This is an unbelievable feeling because when I grew up, we grew up on the stories of the Battle of Stalingrad, which is one of the most defining moments of the Second World War. And I just can't believe myself that I am standing in the same place where Marcel Zhukov had defended this city against the Germans. Standing before the Mamayev Kurgan Memorial is a somber moment for all. This memorial is dedicated to the soldiers who lost their lives in the intense battle to keep control of this hill. An eternal flame is kept burning in their memory. And even today, it is possible to find fragments of metallic shrapnel buried deep inside the hill. The symbolic Mother Russia stands atop brandishing a sword, daring anyone to destroy the hard-won peace. Heading southwards to Astrakhan, which is at the head of the Volga Delta from where the river flows into the Caspian, it is smooth driving for the team. Tires eat up mile after mile as they proceed to Astrakhan without a hitch. But this was where troubles began for Nikitin. As he approached Astrakhan, he and his fellow traders were plundered by the ruling Khan. The moon was shining as we were passing Astrakhan. The king sights us, and he said, flee not. But we paid no heed. Then the king sent his whole horde in pursuit of us. Astrakhan, also a part of the Mongol-dominated Golden Horde, eventually fell to Ivan the Terrible and was rebuilt in the 15th century. This is where Europe and Asia merge. Its Kremlin was built in the 16th century with bricks stolen from the ancient capital of the Golden Horde, Sarai Berke. The church retains many traditional Russian features, while the town is truly an ethnic melting pot. Home to 170 different nationalities, Russian Christians form the majority, followed by Tatars and Kazakh Muslims. The expedition visited the White Mosque built in 1898 by the Saint Hazrat Wahabuddin. It is one of the eight mosques still used for worship today by the Azeris, Kazakhs, Chechens and Tatars. In the past, India's presence in Astrakhan has been considerable. This is all that is left of the Indian trading premises that used to exist in old Astrakhan town until the beginning of the 19th century. The, the community was extremely prosperous, undertook a good deal of trade throughout this region, but gradually drifted back as a result of pressures both internal to Russia and in India, to Central Asia and elsewhere. Trade with India is expected to grow once the state-of-art port Orlea is completed on the Caspian Sea. It will become the bridge to the North-South Corridor that is to facilitate an increase in economic ties between the two countries. The corridor will connect the Indian Ocean and the Persian Gulf to the Caspian Sea via Iran, linking them to the Russian Federation. Astrakhan speeding along the highway, spread out like a black ribbon before them, the expedition enters the Kalmyk Republic. Although Nikitin did not take this route, the team does, since travelling by road through Dagestan is forbidden. This detour gives them an opportunity to learn more about provincial Russia. A Kalmyk reception committee extends a warm welcome, this time with salted tea and donuts. The team is told with great enthusiasm that Indians are long-distant cousins of the Kalmyks, to whom they are related through Cengiz Khan. Yes, it was wonderful. You know, this was what is called the Russian steppes, flat grasslands, and you could almost imagine these Mongol riders on their horses sort of coming through on a cloud of dust. Just... 
Despite a deep sense by now of Russia's cultural and ethnic diversity, nothing quite prepared the expedition for the capital of Kalmykia, Elista. It has the largest monastery in Eurasia, the Gedun Shedib Choykerling, named by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. This Kurul was the idea of Kalmyk immigrant Telo Tulku Rinpoche. The Kalmyks trace their ancestry to Mongolia and are Buddhists. Settled in this region since the 16th century, their religion was almost wiped out by Stalin who destroyed the monasteries and banished the Lamas. Some Kalmyks were exiled to Siberia, though they were later allowed to return. The 90s saw a resurgence of Buddhism as worship was resumed. The presence of an Indian monk bears testimonial to the fact that different races have similar faiths. भारत के कन्नाटा स्टेट मोंगुर तालुक वहाँ पर एक बहुत धर्म का एक बहुत बड़ा मनस्त्री है तिब्बत के तो वहाँ से यहाँ से वहाँ पर एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन कार्ड भेजने से वहाँ प्रचार करने का फिर यहाँ के लोग ज़्यादातर बहुत धर्म में बहुत वो है विश्वास Russia's cultural diversity is visible in its various folk dances. At Elista, some dances remind viewers of what can be seen in Darjeeling or Sikkim. Dance steps vary, tunes change and costumes transform, but the energy remains the same. Travelling is all about interaction and understanding the cultures one comes across. And traditional folk dances are a great way of learning and bonding. The reason behind my coming for this expedition was to explore firstly the Indian-Russian cultural link in terms of performing arts and also see their local variety of traditional folk dances. As the expedition ventures into the far-flung province of Krasnodarsky Krai en route to Kropotkin, the land of Kuban Cossacks, there is yet another welcome. The Cossacks were groups of martial peasants who settled down on this fertile land and are proud of their warrior traditions. The endearing hospitality given by them makes the visit all the more special. Driving down along the coastal road, hugging the Caucasus Mountains, the expedition heads towards Sochi, the last halt in Russia. The Caucasus Mountains stand tall as they form a mountainous bridge between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. The hills change color as equally colorful roadside markets selling local produce are passed. It's a beautiful drive and the tantalizing view of the shimmering Black Sea is a high point for all. Sochi is a fashionable resort town with a modern port and is said to be the second longest city in the world. The last evening in Russia ends with a spectacular sunset on the Black Sea. It's a special moment as the team leaves this wonderful country after an unforgettable journey. A journey full of warmth and hospitality great culture and stunning architecture. The setting sun almost seems to bid farewell. The sky is a riot of colours and the shimmering waters seem to absorb them in a multicoloured celebration of life. The Black Sea is currently being looked at as a promising transport route to ship goods to Russian ports. This will reduce transport time and costs. It is also the most powerful lever of geopolitical influence on a multitude of countries and international processes. Black Sea has got their role that if the Indian goods can come through Black Sea and reach to Northern Russia, and there comes the role of the Black Sea. So in that perspective, I see that Black Sea has got both potential and prospect to enhance the economic engagement of India in erstwhile Soviet Union. By the mercy of God, I reached the Black Sea. Having boarded a ship from Trebizond, I struck a deal for passage to Kaffa.
Although Nikitin sailed from Trebzond to Kaffa in the Crimean port on his return journey, the expedition set sail for the Turkish port of Trabzon. A provincial port of Turkey on the Black Sea coast, Trabzon was earlier known as Trebizond. Its history dates back to 756 BC when it was an important trading colony. By the time Afanasi Nikitin actually arrived here, it had passed to through at least one and slightly more than one avatar, uh, first as a capital of a Byzantine Empire, a truncated Byzantine Empire, that existed here during the early 13th century, and secondly as a uh, center, small center, of the Ottoman Empire, which was then fully in charge uh, of this area by the time of his arrival. The Hagia Sophia, a stunning church of the Byzantine era that was converted into a mosque in the 14th century, can be seen from the busy streets. This was there during Nikitin's time. Leaving Turkey, the expedition drives along the coastal highway heading to Georgia. It's a long drive through the Caucasian range in rain, snow and hail. expedition takes a break at a small town restaurant and lo and behold there's a local TV channel showing a Hindi movie films as soon as they released in India within three weeks they are on DVD in Georgia being shown the next halt is Tbilisi the ancient Georgian capital situated on the banks of the Matkwari River Tbilisi is very Caucasian and very Christian this pretty town is a significant social and cultural centre and is emerging as a major transit route for global energy and trade, courtesy the BTC oil pipeline of Baku, Tbilisi and Chehan. The city is located on the historic Silk Route and is strategically positioned between the Russian Caucasus, Turkey, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Leaving the lofty Caucasus Mountains behind, the expedition heads into the semi-arid region of Azerbaijan with its gentle undulating hills. They arrive at Baku, the city of wind. Boasting of the finest harbour on the Caspian, Baku has been a focus of trade along the Volga and the Caspian Sea for over a millennium. Nikitin came here via Derbent. He was alone. The last of his group had been left behind after the attack by the Kaitaks. Nikitin doesn't say very much about Baku. In Nikitin's time, it was also remarkably the hub of activity. Whether he actually met the Sharvin Shah of that time is something that we have to guess at. The almond-coloured Shrivan Shah complex is the biggest monument of Azerbaijani architecture. It is divided into five courtyards at three different levels and houses a palace and mausoleum. Medieval Azerbaijan had cultural and trade connections with India. More evidence is available at the Atishka temple or the fire temple at Surakhani, where an eternal fire is kept burning. Stone inscriptions in Sanskrit and Gurmukhi at the sacred site give the courtyard a distinctly Indian atmosphere. Built on the ancient site of Pillars of Fire, this temple is now fed by piped gas. It is from here that fire worship spread to Persia and later established itself as the Zoroastrian faith. The site was restored by Indian merchants in 1743 who built various rooms quite like a sarai. The burning fire is now only a memory of what the temple was centuries ago. I felt as though I was standing in a very ancient place my, where my ancestors worshipped. All humanity is just from one seed it has sprung. It is one race uh, essentially. 
Baku has a 700 strong Indian community, primarily businessmen working in the pharmaceutical and petroleum industry. Excited at having Indian travelers in town, the expedition team was treated to a lavish Indian lunch. The oil in Baku was discovered in 1823. Commercial production started only in the early 20th century. The Noble Brothers and other oil investors were the first to start the oil boom in Baku. Less than a century later, the coastline is dotted with oil rigs, tankers and refineries. Diversification of supply is a key component of energy security. Now 68% of India's oil comes from the Persian Gulf region. If we want to diversify, where do we look? Some oil is even coming all the way from Venezuela, but we'll have to be realistic. If we want to diversify, we'll have to look at other near sources. Nigeria is one supply source, Sudan is another. A very important diversification option is the Azeri oil. Twenty-eight days later, the expedition makes its way from Baku to Tehran, Iran's capital. A combination of good roads and cheap fuel makes the drive along the Elbers Mountains most enjoyable. Leaving Baku, Nikitin came to Persia over the Caspian Sea. He stayed here for three years, hoping to restore the fortune he had lost in the earlier part of his journey. From Baku, where the eternal fire is burning, I crossed the sea to Sari in the Mazidaran country. Iran dates back centuries as one of the oldest empires in the world. The very mention of the country evokes images of exquisite carpets, stirring lyrical poetry, miniature paintings, Islamic monuments with gardens reflecting paradise, friendly people and delightful cuisine. After Tehran, the expedition moves into Isfahan, which brings it closer to Nikitin's times and the caravan routes he followed. Grey skies and the snow-capped Zagros mountains form the backdrop as the cars head deeper into the Persian desert. This route is part of the international north-south trade corridor that connects India to Russia via Iran, which is crucial for the growth of commerce of the entire region. Isfahan is the heart of Persian art and culture. Isfahan Nesfe Jahan, as the old saying goes, means Isfahan is half the world. Although its history goes back by 2,500 years, its glory days were in the 17th century. The Jame Mosque, the oldest in the city, dates from the 9th century and was probably there when Nikitin visited. Though much of it has been reconstructed, its inner arches and domes still retain the original brick structure. But all roads lead to Nakshe Jahan, ranked as the most popular place in the city. Its central square, the Medan -e Imam, is the second largest in the world. On any given Friday afternoon, it throngs with the faithful offering namaz. The Imam Mosque dominates the square and is truly an architectural extravaganza. Built by Shah Abbas, it represents the peak of Iranian architecture. In the course of some 500 years, between the 12th century and the 16th, this town became the capital of Persia twice. In the 15th century, at the time when Afanasi Nikitin passed through here, this city was utterly denuded of much of the grandeur that had been its property during the course of the 12th and 13th centuries. On one side of the Imam Square is the jewel of Isfahan, the Sheikh Lutfullah Mosque. Breathtakingly beautiful with its blue exterior, it too was built by Shah Abbas. Somehow, its elaborate design heightens the mosque's spirituality rather than detracts from it. 
Isfahan is truly an architectural symphony. No wonder many of India's finest monuments often drew on Persian architects. Since Iran and India were on the Silk Route, trade and people-to-people -people exchanges were frequent. Ties between these ancient civilizations spanned the entire spectrum – cultural, linguistic, religious and economic. Centuries ago, merchants traded spices, precious stones, textiles and horses. اور کشمش پسته انی روز واتر زعفران اندیام به جگه پندره سر پره بمبه میته هم اچه لگه سب آدمی لو کچه ہے و اس کا چہر اچھا ہے سب چیز اچھا تھا An impressive reminder of the Indo-Persian connection can be seen at the Chael Sultan Palace. This reception hall has a fresco depicting Shah Tamaz welcoming Mughal Emperor Humayun. As the cars glide along smoothly on the Iranian highways, cutting through the barren Zagras mountains, the expedition heads closer to Shiraz and memories of more ancient times. They reach the ruins of the fabled city of Persepolis, which have survived the passage of time and the brunt of invasions. The capital of the Achaemenid Empire, Persepolis was built by the Persian king Darius 2,600 years ago. The Persians call it Takhte Jamshed. Everything about Persepolis is grand. The imposing Gate of Xerxes was also called the Gate of Nations, referring to the 48 territories over which Darius' son Xerxes held sway. The splendor of Persepolis was short-lived. This magnificent palace was looted and burnt down by Alexander the Great in a fit of drunken revelry en route to India. But even the ruins of this Persian city tell a tale of great glory. Shiraz, another Persian capital, is a city of poets, flowers and carpets. Spread out like an expansive garden, at nearly every corner there's a monument, a mosque. This land was home to the great Sufi poet Hafiz. Today his tomb is revered and attracts millions of visitors. His mystical poetry influenced generations with its theme of divine love. The Indian sage Meher Baba actually recited Hafiz's poetry while dying. Such was its power and poignancy. Taking cherished memories with them, the group sets off from Iran and heads home to India, as Nikitin had 537 years ago via the Straits of Hormuz. He heard many fairy tales about India, because some of them, they came from India, they went via uh, Arabic countries and they came to Russia, sometimes from Byzantine, sometimes directly from Arabic countries. They were talking about India, not so much about the real India already, but as a land of wonder. After Easter, I sailed across the Arabian Sea on a daba, with horses for trade. Nikitin made his way towards India, an ancient land with strong roots and spirituality, a kaleidoscope of exotic cultures, languages, customs, cuisines, religions and arts. An enigma to Nikitin, since no Russian had ever set foot on it before. Nikitin arrived with a single commodity, a stallion which he intended to sell. 
everything he saw around him was exotic. Religious customs were unusual, people spoke in unfamiliar tongue and had different skin tones. Wherever he went, he roused curiosity and was followed as the white man. Nikitin first landed at Chol, a small village close to present-day Mumbai. And this is where the Indian leg of the expedition begins. At the monument dedicated to the memory of Nikitin, arriving on Indian shores. Standing strong at the SRT High School in Ravdanda, it symbolizes the 500-year-old Indo-Russian friendship. A friendship that is valued and nurtured further through people-to-people -people contact and Russian studies at universities. Diplomatic relations, as we understand, started here in 19th century, in the early beginning. Then, if we can say, diplomatic relations between uh, Russia, East while USSR, and uh, India started in 1947. In India, we have uh, cultural centers uh, acting since for the period of 30 years. So our main task is uh, to bring uh, Russian culture, to bring Russian education here and uh, make it closer to Indian people. Leaving Chol, the team arrives at the small town of Junar, surrounded by the Western Ghats in Maharashtra. The town of Junar lies on a rocky island, not built by man, but created by God. It takes a whole day's uphill walk to go there. The path is narrow and two people cannot pass. The rocky slope of Nikitin's time still exists today. It is at Junar that he got his first insights into Indian life. Shirin Masood, an expert in medieval Indian history, joins the expedition here. From Junar, the expedition proceeds towards Bidar, in the northernmost part of Karnataka, just as Nikitin did more than five centuries ago. That Nikitin visited the Bahamani kingdoms during its golden years is evident from his writings. Bidar is the capital of Muslim Hindustan. It is a large city and many people live in it. Today, a tiny district steeped in history, Bidar has remnants of magnificent forts, cannons, old palaces and tombs. The fort's arched entrance even today evokes a sense of quiet awe at the sheer splendor of the Bahmini kingdom. Bahmani Sultanate started sometime in the middle of the 14th century when an Afghan a uh, soldier uh, in the army of Muhammad bin Tughlaq decided to take advantage of the situation that Muhammad bin Tughlaq had returned to Delhi to um, raise his own standard of independence and declare this to be his own territory. He was called Hassan Gangu and he called himself Alauddin Hassan Bahman Shah, the first of the Bahmani Sultans. The red ramparts of the imposing Bidar fort that once guarded the city are perched on rocky cliffs that overlook the Deccan Plateau. It has five entrances with the Sharaza Darwaza as its main gate. This is the very gateway through which Nikitin entered and saw the impressive regal procession of Sultan Muhammad Shah III. Close by this is the Jame Mosque, also known as the Sola Khamba Mosque. 
surrounded by gardens laid out in typical Islamic style, it seems straight out of the pages of an Arabian Nights fantasy. Bidar is of particular interest to the Russian government, and even today, local memory ties the past to the present as the inhabitants are aware of old Indo-Russian ties. When the diary was published, USSR government was curious about Bidar. They wanted to know about Bidar. The municipal chairman of this city was invited to Russia. There he was honored. Although only ruins remain to tell a tale of the past glory, the residents of Bidar are proud of their heritage, and even more so when they read Nikitin's account of Bidar. Nikitin mentions Malika Tajur or Mahmud Gawan often. Gawan, a powerful trader from Persia, came to India and stayed on. He patronized trade between Persia and Bahmani extensively. He also became the kingdom's prime minister, its virtual ruler. During Nikitin's visit to Bidar, Gawan constructed a famous madrasa where students from all over the world studied. Since the language of the court and elite during the 15th century was Persian, Nikitin's familiarity with the language may have been one of the reasons why he stayed here longer. From Persia, we have master craftsmen arriving, we have scholars arriving, Sufi saints arriving. So there is a lot of, uh, you know, interaction and give and take. Gulbarga was the first capital of the Bahamani Sultanate and Nikitin mentions his visit to the town. Many uh, monuments described by Nikitin, they still survived in India. This is very important. India now is a, a life story of Nikitin traveling. Not much is left of the city today except for the fort with the one-of-a-kind Jama Masjid inside its ramparts. Modelled on the Cordoba Mosque in Spain, it is one of the earliest mosques in South India and the only one without an open courtyard. Long after Nikitin left India, the Bahamani Kingdom split up into five states, Bijapur being one of them. A provincial town in Nikitin's time, it was extended by Sultan Yusuf Adil Shah. He took Islamic culture to great heights and developed his state as a centre for Sufism in the Deccan. The most famous monument at Bijapur is definitely the Gol Gumbas. This tomb of Muhammad Adil Shah II finds pride of place as the second largest dome in the world. This dome is completely unsupported and transforms into a virtual whispering gallery, where the slightest whisper gets amplified across the other side of the Gumbas. Living in India, Nikitin had the opportunity to interact with people of various faiths. Since the Bahamani kingdom was Islamic and Nikitin an Orthodox Christian, his faith was often questioned. Having lost a sense of the Christian calendar, his life came to revolve around the Muslim festivals that happened to coincide with Christian feast days. As for the great Christian feast, the resurrection of Christ, I know not when to keep it. I fasted with the Muslims and broke my fast when they broke theirs. He looked through the Russian eyes. He was an Orthodox. He didn't know about the Brahmanism, Hindu religion, uh, Buddhism like this, Muslims, not, he was not so acquainted with this. But he was re received with a great respect. During his stay at Bidar, he came into close contact with Hindus as well and began to understand many aspects of their religion, the worship of idols and the broad view of Hinduism of that time. Nikitin engaged with both Islam as well as with Hinduism when he was in Bidar. The engagement with Islam is fairly clear. He came to understand Hinduism in shadows, perhaps. 
For Nikitin, India was clearly a world unlike any other he had seen or experienced before in terms of customs, culture, religion, architecture. Today, this diversity still exists, and the team members get a sample of the country's sheer variety as they drive through the small towns of South India. Badami, the last capital of the Chalukyas, is known for its 6th century Hindu cave temples. Temples that attempt to combine both Vaishnavite and Shaivite deities to create a syncretic cult. In the course of the discussion of what Hindus believed in, he came to be acquainted with a broader world of spiritualism of different types. The spiritual landscape was vast. Vijayanagar was part of such a landscape. Other territories of the Bahmani kingdom were part of this landscape. It was a huge kaleidoscope of different cults and beliefs that Nikitin was touching on. Vijayanagar was the capital of Hinduism and Nikitin was well aware of it, given the hostility between the Vijayanagar and the Bahamani kingdoms. Malik Atajur had set out to reduce the Indian Kingdom of Vijayanagar and the Prince of Vijayanagar had 300 elephants and an army of 100,000. It is here at Hampi, once the seat of the Vijayanagar Empire, that Hinduism's open-mindedness is evident. Every boulder, every path, every monument at the ruins of Hampi speaks the same language, a language of beauty, creativity and tolerance. The Vithila temple complex is an architectural masterpiece which was started during the reign of Krishna Dev Raya. Legend has it that Lord Vishnu found the Vithila temple too grand to live in and returned to his abode in heaven. This intricacy of faith and complexity of religion is what Nikitin encountered. Hindu practices raised questions in him about the nature of God. His Muslim friends pointed to his lack of knowledge of Christianity. His own self-doubt and questioning of faith were the result. And so, Nikitin fell into a great anguish. Woe to me, miserable sinner, for I have strayed from the true path. Almighty God, Turn not thy face from thy servant who sorrows. Having spent three years in India, Nikitin decided to return to Russia one Easter Sunday. His religious dilemma, along with love for his homeland, urged him back to Russia, to his own people. And there I, Afanasi, a damned servant of Almighty God, pondered over the Christian faith, the baptism of Christ, and I longed to go to Rus. In 1474, he left India from the great port of Dabhol on the Malabar coast. It was to be autumn when he reached the Black Sea by which time the depression caused by his spiritual predicaments faded and the wonder of all he had seen came back to him. In Kaffa, Nikitin began to assemble his memories and notes into a travelogue. This first version of the voyage across the three seas, Nikitin carried with him as he made for home in 1475, only to die at Smolensk. It is this manuscript that survived in copies to give later generations a picture of Nikitin the adventurous Russian merchant, who gave the world a storehouse of knowledge regarding life in 15th century India, opening a strong door to a friendship between Russia and India that would last for centuries. Nikitin will always be remembered as the quintessential traveller who followed his dreams and inner urging, as the first ambassador to the two countries, blurring boundaries, enhancing understanding and 
forging ties that remain strong even today. We salute this solitary traveller for reminding us that the world is one, one earth, one hope, one destiny.